So I'd like to welcome you to this study on Daniel and the Revelation. And I'm Dr. Jim Saeed, and this is my beloved wife, Rhonda, and she and I are going to be presenting this together. And I'd like to begin this presentation with just a moment of prayer, if you'll join me, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit guide this study as you lead us into all truth and show us things to come. May you make it clear. May you make it simple. We can understand why you languaged the words that you have in prophecy the way you have that we may understand what to expect in this end of time as this earth comes to its close. For this I ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we've been studying the books of Daniel and Revelation for years. And I'd like to center the beginning of the study actually in the middle, looking at the chapter 11 of Daniel. Now Daniel chapter 11 has been a difficult chapter for many people to, to, to navigate or negotiate. And the reason is this. Daniel was given insight from the Lord in terms of prophetic events that take place from his time in the 6th century B.C. to the end of time in Christ's second coming. He was given symbolic information initially showing the progression of nations from his time till our time in symbol. But in Daniel 11, he was given this, a further detail of information in literal language, specific historical events. And it was put in somewhat cryptic fashion as a puzzle. So it requires digging. It also requires an in-depth understanding of history. So what we'd like to do is go verse by verse, describing what the language is, what the history was, and why it was given the way it was and you will see a form, a pattern forming that shows that the history that is being given to Daniel is significant as a type or precedent of what must come at the end of time, or an antitype as it's called, in our day. So he was given information for us to understand today. And we'll see how that plays itself out specifically. So you're saying that history will be repeated, and that if we can get the history down, we can understand some of the things that are going to happen at the end of time. Amen. In our time. Exactly. Hmm. And that's what amazes me, that this prophecy was given 2,600 years ago describing what's happening in our country, in our nation today. That's this is the Lord's protection and care and leading for us today. Well, and the Bible says, that God says, I will do nothing, but first I reveal it to you through the prophets. And so we're going into the prophet Daniel to see that history. And when we can get the details down, you're saying that we can see what's happening today. It will unlock many of the issues of today, right, in our time that's headed to a time of trouble. Yes, yes. exactly that. Hmm. So let me just begin by way of a very brief introduction. So we see that Daniel is a, is a basis for understanding all of prophecy. And the way it was written was what's called repeat and enlarge from Daniel chapters 1 through 12. So initially Daniel is given insight and he's shown so much of the picture, prophetic picture, and then he prays further to have more insight because it doesn't make clear sense to him. So he's given further insight all the way through the chapters 1 through 12. When we come to chapters 11 and 12, Daniel's given immense insight and detail as we'll unravel as we go through this process. Now, Revelation is significant. The book of Revelation given to John, the apostle, is a complement or supplement to Daniel. Daniel is a foundation for all of Revelation. Now, as we'll see, Daniel 11 is actually a recapitulation or summary of the preceding chapters of Daniel. And then Revelation fits into Daniel 11. So Daniel 11 becomes the actual foundation to understand Revelation. When we piece the two together, we start seeing a very clear picture of what's happening in the world today. 
Hmm. Well, I know that there's two <clears throat> lessons that we'll have today just getting through the first three quarters of Daniel and 11, chapter 11. We'll get through the first third. Oh, really? <laughs> and so there's going to be a lot of detail, but I welcome all of you to really pick up the detail of history because you'll be able then to apply it when we start unlocking the book of Revelation. Exactly. And one way I formatted this particular presentation mm -hmm. is as we go line by line, verse by verse, we're going to detail the specific historical events that each word in each verse depicts. Hmm. So it becomes very clear what Daniel is referring to in his future in our history. So we know that one is a prophecy, that's Daniel, the other revelation is exactly that, a revelation of Jesus Christ. So over time, over the ne next several lectures, we're going to be piecing those two together hmm. and see exactly how prophecy and revelation meet. So as we go through Daniel 11, there's a he and a he and a he, and you don't know what he is that they're referring to, that Daniel's referring to. So we found a, a fun little way to do it is maybe read it through the way it, it reads, but then have Dr. Saeed fill in the he for who that is, and it makes it a lot clearer and a lot easier to follow. And we'll see there's a pattern that's very specific and logical. So, let me give you a summary of Daniel chapter 11. And we'll be taking a number of lectures to go through this. Um, I pray we can get verse through verse 23 in this first series. So, Daniel chapter 11 begins with the rise and fall of Medo-Persia. Now, Medo-Persia is a nation that conquered Babylon. So, Babylon falls by chapter 10 of Revelation. Chapter 11 begins the rise and fall of Medo Persia, but very quickly. And in a moment we'll see why it's so quick. Then the next 14 verses is the rise and fall of Grecia, or Greece as we would call it in history. And that turns out to be highly significant through a series of wars called the Six Syrian Wars. And we'll see why it, we'll see why it plays out to that point and no further. Would you say that uh, more people ask this one question than any other question. They ask, why did God spend so much time in this book going through, leading up clear earth and going through these six Syrian wars? And what we found is interesting is this all leads up to show how Egypt, um, the king of the south, and Babylon, the king of the north, ended up turning their power, their whole nation, over to Rome. So when we're talking in the end about Rome, this shows how that the king of the north and the king of the south, which would be um, Babylon and Egypt, turned over, as request their power, they turned over their whole government to Rome and why they did that. And many of the, uh, in Rome today, the symbolism and a lot of the um, mythology and history of what's made up of Rome came from Babylon and Egypt. And so it's important to understand this because you'll see a parallel of what's going to happen in the United States and in the world. Amen. And what Ron is referring to is North and South kingly conflict. And Daniel 11 is written around three King of the North, King of the South conflicts throughout history. So we're going to deal with the first series of King of the North, King of the South conflicts that arose, arose in Greece. So the Lord gives us an immense amount of detail of that north-south conflict in Greece to show exactly what's going on today. And I'll give you a quick sneak preview. Oh, good. The north is Babylonia, the south is, Gre is, is Egypt of the Grecian Empire. We will see how it relates to today's two-party system in this country. I'll hmm. leave it at that for now. That's just a nibble. But it will become clear as we, as we watch this unfold. Now, once Greece falls by verse 16a, the first half of verse 16, we see what emerges is Rome on the prophetic scene. Now, Rome goes through four phases. The first phase of Rome is a republic. The second is Roman, Rome as an empire. The third is Rome as a papal empire, or a papal Rome as it's called. And the fourth is a revived papal Rome. It's a term I use 
to describe the last phase of Rome today. It's about to emerge. So verses 16b through 19, the second half of verse 16 to 19, is the fall of the Roman Republic. Then we see the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, the next ten verses. Then the rise and fall of the Papal Roman system, next nine verses. And finally the last five verses is revived Papal Rome today. So that's the structure of, of Daniel 11 historically. So we're going to start with Medo-Persia, shift to Greece, shift to Roman Republic, shift to the Roman Empire, shift to Papal Rome, shift to revive Papal Rome, and what's happening today in our country. So stay with us for the next few sessions, because this won't all happen in this one session, but this is the session one on, on this review. Amen. Yeah. To go through it fast would be unfair. So I'm going to just piece by piece unfold this. Okay, so let's see. Now we're going to start. There's a summary of Daniel 11 that's really critical. And I'm going to just simply name this, and then we're going to start studying this out specifically. So Daniel 11 is flanked by two bookends. Either bookend describes Michael. At one end, in chapter 10, Michael is emergent and preserves the Jewish ceremonial system. That's chapter 10, the very last verse, verse 21, it, where Michael ends that chapter in the beginning of 11. And right. Then, and then chapter 12 is Michael comes to deliver God's people. So that would be 12, 1, chapter 12, verse 1, right. the beginning of the next chapter. So we'll start our study in just a moment with who is Michael and what do these two verses represent and why are they significant on either end of chapter 11 of Daniel. So I'd like to introduce a summary of Daniel 11, but we're going to see first that 10 and 12 flank Daniel 11 very specifically, bringing in Michael. You mean Daniel t chapter 10, the last verse, Amen. and chapter 12, the first verse? Yes. yes. Thank you. So Daniel 10, we're going to see in two verses, verses 10 and 21. Michael is brought into view, and Michael is going to preserve the ceremonial system to ensure that the world will see the work of Christ in the plan of salvation. Michael is seen again in chapter 12, verse 1, where he comes to deliver God's people, that completes the plan of salvation for God's people, as Christ comes for them, and they return with him in heaven for the next thousand years. Now, let's look at how this has worked, how this is flanked. This is the structure of Daniel 11, but I'm going to look at 10 and 12 for also. So you see the two red arrows on either end is Michael, preserving the ceremonial system and delivering God's people. But then we see the structure of Daniel 11 specifically. We see the, there's three segments to Daniel 11. The first segment deals with effectively the beginning of sin and the fall of Babylon to the cross. And that's what I want to study with you today. Okay. The second we'll see is another phase of prophecy from Constantine to Justinian and the rise of the papacy. The last is the Reformation and close of probation and, and seven last plagues. So this is, the era, this is the arena covered by Daniel 11. It's a huge swath of history. So we'll begin. First looking at the ceremonial system and Michael. So Rhonda, would you please read Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. Okay, Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter, the latter days. days. For Amen. yet the vision is for many days. So, so he's showing that it's future and it's for the last days. Exactly. And then chapter 10, verse 21. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me these things, but Michael, your prince. So here we see Michael in chapter 10. We're going to describe exactly who this is in just a moment. Then we see Michael again in chapter 12, verse 1. Right. I'll have you read that also. Okay. Twelve. 
And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Would Amen. that be the book of life? Yes, precisely and, that. And we see that Michael's standing up, uh, he's standing for his children, and it's a t during, then there's a gigantic time of trouble, worse than has ever been on the earth. Since, there was, since, the, since time began. Yes. Never such a time of trouble as then. Now, I want to unpack Michael first, and then unpack these verses before and after chapter 11 of Daniel. So, we're going to look at three verses. Jude 9, mm. Revelation 12, 7, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. To appreciate first, who is Michael? So, let's read first Jude 9. Jude, verse 9. Verse 9 says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Amen. So I'm going to look at a brief commentary of Jude 9. Well, it's saying here that Michael is the Lord. Yes. Because it says, Michael, and then the Lord rebuke thee. Amen. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read a brief summary that says this, Christ resurrects, resurrected Moses and took him to heaven. This enraged Satan, and he accused the Son of God of invading his dominion by robbing the grave of his lawful prey. So here's Moses, a sinner, that Satan's claiming as his own. Jude says of the resurrection of Moses, yet Michael the archangel, we know that to be Christ now, who resurrects Moses, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. So Jesus himself doesn't rebuke Satan, and doesn't accuse him, but only rebukes him in the Lord. That's our example. It's not for us to accuse another person. Let the Lord rebuke them. But here is the archangel who is contending with the body of Moses, we know now to be Jesus. Jesus is the archangel. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Okay. Re um, Jesus is called so many different things, everything from a shepherd to... Um, the lion of the tribe of Judah, right. and he's called here the archangel because he was dealing with the angels in heaven Amen. at at one time before he came to the earth, and so. Amen. Go ahead. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels. Amen. The dragon being Satan, we find, and that the Bible says the dragon, that old serpent, and Satan. Amen. So we see in commentary, it says, The Father decides the case of Satan, this is in heaven, and declares that he must be turned out of heaven for his daring rebellion, and that all those who united with him in his rebellion should be turned out with him. That induces a war in heaven. Then there was war in heaven. Christ and his angels, Christ and his angels fought against Satan and his angels. So we know Michael now is again Christ. For they were determined to remain in heaven with all their rebellion but they prevailed not. Christ and his loyal angels triumphed and drove Satan and his rebellion, his rebel sympathizers from heaven. So again, Jesus now we know to be Michael. Let's go to one other verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. Okay. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. So this is the second coming. Amen. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Amen. So those in the grave that were dead rise up. Exactly. Do you want so I'm going to brief commentary. Mm -hmm. So the voice of the Son of God called forth the sleeping saints. This is the second coming. Clothed the glorious immortality. The living saints were caught in a moment, or changed in a moment, and were caught up with them into, into the cloudy chariot. So as though they're still alive, God's people are still alive at the end of time, when Christ comes, will be caught up into that cloudy chariot with Christ and the saints that are being resurrected from the grave. But the voice of the Son of God, the archangel, his voice is calling them forward. And then we read it further, that for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. This is Jesus who's calling. 
and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we always be with the Lord. Now that's a key. At Christ's second coming, he doesn't come to the earth to touch the ground. We rise to meet him in the air. There have been many who have attempted to describe what happens at the second coming. I've read all kinds of possibilities, but the Bible is very specific about one distinct and only possibility. Jesus comes, does not touch the ground, we rise up into the air to meet him, and are carried back to heaven with him, and the angels he comes with. So we see that the archangel, Michael, is Jesus. Now, when we come to uh, chapter 10, verses 13 and 21, which you've read, I'd like to read a commentary. You're talking about Daniel chapter about 10? Daniel chapter 10, starting in verse 13. Mm -hmm. So, for three weeks, said so for 21 days, for three weeks, Gabriel wrestled with the powers of darkness, seeking to counteract the influence of work at work on the mind of Cyrus. Now, Cyrus conquers Babylonia in 539 B.C. And he is going to be allowing the Jews to return to rebuild Jerusalem in the temple, to reinstate their system of worship. And he sends this decree out in 537 when he gains sole rule of Persia, and the next year is when the Jews will return to Jerusalem in 536. Now, Cyrus issues the decree in 537, but very few Jews take up the work to return to Jerusalem. Didn't they like their comfort there in Babylon? They were they had they were just two blocks to the 7-Eleven, you know? <laughs> it was very uh, convenient, and they had wealth and comfort. And they were accustomed to it after 70 years of captivity. Right. And Jerusalem had been ransacked and torn up, and it was a pretty rough um, living style for them until they could put the city and their places back together. Exactly. And homes. Yeah. So they would be inconvenienced. Yeah. Now, do we also abhor inconvenience? This is what Cyrus was contending with that the Jews did not want to be inconvenienced and return and rebuild Jerusalem. So he was becoming disheartened. So Gabriel is working on the mind of Cyrus to have him persist in this process of issuing a decree and following through to allow the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. It says, And before the contest closed, Christ himself came to Gabriel. Now this is Michael. Christ himself came to Gabriel's aid. You're saying Gabriel is the highest of the angels and Michael Christ is the one that came to Gabriel. Mm -hmm. Now Gabriel is the angel that's giving the prophecies to Daniel. And he's saying Michael himself, Christ himself, came to Gabriel's aid in working with Cyrus. And quotes, the prince of the king of the, the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, Gabriel declared. But lo Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. In Daniel 10, verse 13, the victory was finally gained. The forces of the enemy were held in check all the days of Cyrus and all the days of his son, Cam his son Cambyses. So, Michael, again we see, is Jesus. Now, in the last of this segment, chapter 12, looking at the deliverance of God's people, we see again Michael, and Rhonda read chapter 12, verse 1. And we will see a commentary that makes it very explicitly clear what's going on here. When the third angel's message closes, mercy no longer pleads for the guilty inhabitants of the earth. This is the end of time. The people of God have accomplished their work. This is the work we're being asked to do now. The final test has been brought upon the world. And all who have proved themselves loyal to the divine precepts have received the seal of the living God. We said the third segment of the study is about the seal of God versus the mark of the beast. This is the seal of God being received by the, God's people. Then Jesus seizes his inter intercession in the sanctuary above. He lifts his hands and with a loud voice says, It is finished. This is the work of Michael we will see in the uh, heavenly so most holy place. So that's the close of probationary time when Jesus lifts his hand and says, It's finished. That means there's no more time to for any sinner or any person to change their mind. That's the, the end of probationary exactly. time. Salvation means nothing more for anybody else at that point. Everyone's 
fate is completely sealed. So that's because they've sealed it in their own hearts. They have made their decision. Exactly. And the Holy Spirit can't do anything more once the will is set against God. Exactly. Yeah. So the message to the world has been given for them to make their choice between Christ and eternal life right. and self yeah. and eternal loss. So we see one other point being made here. Jacob's night of wrestling, another comment about the same verse. The night of wrestling and anguish represents the time of trouble to which the people of God must pass just prior to the second coming of Christ. This is after the close of probation. Daniel in prophetic vision looking down to this point says, and at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince, as we've read before. Again referring to Christ. That's the point of this, that Michael is okay. Jesus. Now, now that we know that Jesus himself ensured the ceremonial system would be established through the Jews in ancient Israel, and that Jesus would be coming to deliver us, as Michael, with the holy angels from heaven, now we're going to look at the specifics of Daniel 11. And I'm going to start with the first segment of the King of the North, King of the South pattern. And... I want to look at the structure of Daniel 11, the first 22 verses. We will see that this pattern begins with Babylonian captivity. Now, Babylonian captivity is in a sequence of events that the Bible demonstrates from the beginning of sin in heaven with Lucifer down to the captivity of God's people in Babylonia. So I'm simply going to start there. And Daniel 11 will take us through the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Republic, the Roman Empire to Christ in his first advent in his outer court ministry and the cross and overcoming sin and death for all humanity and taking sin and death to the grave. Now, there's a principle I want to cover as we see this pattern behind prophetic history. You'll notice there's a progression of nations from Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece to Rome and Rome in its four phases. But why does it transfer from one nation to another? What's behind this? What's the principle behind it? I want to quote this from the book called Education, a beautifully written book. Every nation that has come upon the stage of action has been permitted to occupy its place on earth that it might be seen what? Whether it would fulfill the purpose of the Watcher and the Holy One, the purpose of God. Prophecy has traced the rise and fall of the world's great empires, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Each of these, has, as with nations of less power, history is repeated, in, in, repeating itself in these nations. Why? Each has its period of test to demonstrate God's government and God's character. Each failed. Its glory faded. Its power departed. And its place occupied by another. So each was given an opportunity to demonstrate Christ and his character and God's government to the world. That's why they were given a position of power. Each sadly failed. Then we see while the nations rejected God's principles, in this rejection wrought their own ruin. The Lord didn't destroy them, they destroyed themselves. It was still manifest that the divine overruling purpose was working through all their movements, so no matter what they did, they could not interrupt God's providential workings to bring all of us to Him. So the crown, we're told, removed from Israel, passed successfully to kingdoms of Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, and then Rome. God says it shall be more, no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it to him, to Jesus. So this progression followed, and man failed to represent God to the world. Who could represent God to the world? God himself, as his son, Jesus. So, Babylon, Medo Persia, failed to represent God's character and government. So did Greece. And we're going to see how that happened now. So the Grecian kings occupy two regions, north and south of God's people in Judea. Northern kings were the Babylonian region of Grecia. The southern kings were the Egyptian re uh, domain of Grecia. In the middle was Judea, where God's people were, set, were centered. To the west was the Mediterranean Sea, not passable. To the east was the Arabian Desert, not passable. 
So the Lord positioned God's people in what's called the Fertile Crescent, or the Levant, so that the two armies between the northern Babylonian Grecian Empire and the southern Egyptian Grecian Empire had to pass through Judea to receive the message of, the, of God's providences and his desire for humanity to come to him. Now, all these kings in the north and south were not God's people, they were Satan's people, Satan's agents. They did not demonstrate to the world God's attempt to show himself and his character and his government. So we're going to go to Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Okay. And you read first. Now we'll see the details of that history. So Daniel chapter 11. Verses 1 and 2. Verse 1 and 2. Also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I, stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. Ah, thank you. So this is a more direct verse, and we'll see how. So I'm going to do it word by word, and you'll see exactly how this fits together. So also I, this is the angel Gabriel talking to, to Daniel. In the first year of Darius the Mede, that was 539 B.C., and Darius the Mede is the uncle of Cyrus the Great. Now, Darius the Mede is also called Cyaxerxes II. Cyrus is Cyrus II, the Great. And he was the king of Persia. Yes. Darius and the Medes. The Medes. Was, Cyrus was the king of Persia. Mm -hmm. Darius was the king of the Medes. I see. And it was the uncle of Cyrus the Great. So out of deference to his uncle, Cyrus gives Darius the kingdom of Babylonia to become the viceroy or controlling ruler of Babylonia. Okay. And that was in 539. So Gabriel continues, even I, the angel Gabriel, stood to confirm and strengthen him. Now here he's strengthening Darius the Mede. It says, strengthen us to fortify, help, and encourage him, resulting in Darius's decree that all in his kingdom should fear the God of Daniel. Yeah. This is after Daniel was rescued from the lion's den. This allowed Daniel to prosper in the reign of Darius and Cyrus the Great, preparing Israel's, for Israel's freedom to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So the Lord's hand was in this. So Darius was upheld by angel Gabriel and strengthened to move through this process that Daniel would be prepared to give the message of the gospel to both Darius and Cyrus. And then he says, And now will I show thee the truth. Who's the I? I is Gabriel. Okay. He's going to show Daniel the truth. Behold, there stand up, th or stand up is a rise to rule, yet three kings in Persia. This is after Cyrus the Great. So the three Persian kings that prevail after Cyrus are his son Cambyses the second, then Smyrtus the Magian, also called the False Smyrtus, he is a usurper or pretender to the throne, and then Darius the First the Great. Those are the three following Persian kings. And the fourth, which is Xerxes, or Xerxes the first, or Xerxes the Great, also called Ahasuerus in the book of Esther, he took Esther as his bride, shall be far richer than they all. Now, Xerxes was immensely wealthy. He was more wealthy than all the three previous kings we described. And by his strength, he developed a massive army over a million people. He was going to come against the Grecians. So he amasses this huge army. In fact, he looked upon the army and in tears said, in a hundred years, none of these people will be alive to remember this. So through his riches and immense wealth shall he stir up all the surrounding nations of Grecia especially. Now Greece was a ser series of distinct tribes that were not in cohesiveness with each other. It was not, it was not a, a cohesive nation. But as Xerxes is preparing to attack Greece, these become a nation state and they rally together against Persia. So he comes against the realm of Greece and Xerxes incites war against Greece in 484 79 BC. Now, Xerxes is beaten, he's defeated. And this is just a list of Persian kings. And the first four after Cyrus you see is Cambyses, Smyrtus, Darius I, and Xerxes. Now, 
we see that th that Persia comes to its end. The last Persian see king you see is Darius the third, Cotamanus, in this list, and he's defeated in 330 by Alexander the Great, as we'll see. So that brings us to verses 3 and 4 of chapter 11, if you'd be so kind to read, sweetheart. And a mighty king shall stand up. Is that Alexander the Great? You'll see that to be Alexander the Great. Okay. A mighty king shall stand up and shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Amen. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his own posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. Amen. So this again is more straightforward. Can you just read it the, the way, read, read it, it with historically. he being what it is? Amen. So yeah. a mighty king, that's Alexander the Great, in 331, he stands up or arises that, he sh that shall rule with a great dominion. His dominion is from Greece and Egypt to northern India. Hmm. The reason he went into Egypt, by the way, was to control the coastlands, because he had no navy. So the navy of other nations would be a threat to him, so he made it all the way to Egypt to control the Mediterranean. So he goes to Egypt, controls all of that all the way to India, to the east. So it's a great dominion, and he does according to his will, meaning unopposed by any ruler in his conquered territory. So when it ever says, does according to his will, there's no opposing ruler. Now, and when he, Alexander the Great, shall stand up or arise to rule, his kingdom shall be broken. Now, Alexander the Great conquered the known world at that time in 10 years. Yeah. Unheard of. And so, we see that at the end of that 10 years, he dies young in what historians believe to be a drunken stupor when he was celebrating his victory with one of the generals and was drinking a very large um, goblet of alcohol and went into a, an alcoholic coma and died. And that death was in 323 B.C. And shall be divided, so his kingdom shall be broken at his death in 323 B.C. He had no heir. So there was now vying for control of Egypt or of Egypt, Babylonia, all of Grecia, and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven. Now west was Greece under Cassander, this is when four rulers emerged finally. North was Thrace and Asia Minor under Lysimachus. East was Syria, Babylon under Seleucus. The south was Egypt under Ptolemy. So he had four generals, Lysimachus to the west, um, excuse me, Cassander to the west, Lysimachus to the north, Seleucus to the east, and, and Ptolemy to the south. So they controlled Grecia, but were vying for control, each one as sole ruler. And not to his posterity, so not to Alexander's posterity, so it was not given to his posterity, which was his son, born after Alexander's death, but he was murdered, which is common practice, by the way, sadly, throughout history, as we'll see. If you didn't want someone to compete with you in position of power, you'd kill them. And this is standard practice throughout the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. And we still see it today, sadly. So not to his posterity or his son who was murdered, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled for his kingdom, shall be plucked up or torn apart even for others besides those, that is, of his posterity. So it turns out there are about 20 generals and satraps at Alexander's death vying for control of the entire empire. So this massive maneuvering to control Greece. And it then was reduced down to the four? Yes. Yeah. And then we'll see to two. Well, that's right before um, <laughs> the power was given over to Rome, or that's what led to their power being given to Rome. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. as we'll see. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to see happening in the next several verses to verse 16a is there's a conflict that happens between the North Dynasty of Babylonia and the southern dynasty of Egypt. King of the north, king of the south conflict. And it goes through what are called six Syrian wars. When you study out history, these events are specific through six Syrian wars between the north and south dynasties. You see, these rulers sought control 
not by God's way, but by intrigue, by deception, by collusion, by intermarriage, by war and murder. So we see these two dynasties in the north around Judea. The north is the Seleucid dynasty, finally, and the south is the Ptolemaic dynasty of Egypt. So those four that we saw ended up as two. Now, and those two were then referred to as the king of the north, meaning Babylonia, and the king of the south, meaning Egypt? Precisely. Mm -hmm. And Babylonia included Asia Minor to Greece, as Seleucid controlled all of what was controlled by Lysimachus and Cassander. They were killed, and now just Seleucus and Ptolemy of the Babylonian north and the Egyptian south were left. So now we're going to go to verse 5. And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him, and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. So again, this is more straightforward. The king of the south is Ptolemy the first. Now Ptolemy the first is the first king of Babylonian uh, uh, Egyptian Egypt. Greece. Egypt. King of the, of the south. south. The south is Egypt, yes. Shall be strong, but one of his princes Another general, Seleucus, was a friend of Ptolemy's initially, shall be strong above him, above Ptolemy the first. So the two of them colluded to destroy Lysimachus, and then they vied for control over each other, but were unsuccessful. So Seleucus controls Babylonia, Ptolemy controls Egypt. So the one that's stronger, Seleucus, shall be strong above Ptolemy the first, above him, that's the first, that's at him and have dominion, his dominion, that is Seleucus' dominion, shall be a great dominion. So Seleucus controls a larger part of the empire in the north than Ptolemy controls in the south. So it's literally a bigger property that he controls, bigger territory. Now, um, we see the intrigue that happened after Alexander's death bringing this about. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that much, but I'm going to show you this progression. We're going to see now emergent six Syrian wars, six attempts of the north and south to control each other, always unsuccessful as we'll see. Neither one prevailed. Now I mentioned at the outset that this is equivalent to a two-party system that we have in this country, mm -hmm. wanting to control politics in this country as we'll see unfold. I and just simply and put that these into the two end up giving their power over to Rome. First they want Rome to protect them from the other, and then they end up, both of them, turning their whole nation over to Rome. As and we will see. Then Rome took over all of that territory. Precisely. Yeah. So and that was it. all before Christ's time. That's what's going to happen here. Yes, and that's precisely what's going to happen here. So we're going to see this pattern being a foundation for what's going to be repeated in history in our time as will unfold. Mm -hmm. So I just listed here a summary of the six Syrian wars. Now we're going to go through it in detail. We're going to start with verse 6. So I'm going to just lay out the foundation. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. The first Syrian war is a decade into the rule of Ptolemy II. This is the son of Ptolemy I. He faces Antiochus II, or some say Antiochus. I'm not a Greek scholar, so I'm going to try Antiochus. So Antiochus I is the son of Seleucus. And is this the, the uh, Babylonian Empire? <laughs> So Ptolemy is always the south Egypt. Oh, Egypt. Seleucus or Antiochus or Antiochus is the north Babylonia. So here you have Ptolemy the second and Antiochus the first, which are the sons of the initial rulers, now vying for control. So the Seleucid king, Antiochus the first, was trying to expand his empire's holdings into Syria and Anatolia, and Ptolemy II proved to be a forceful ruler and a skilled general. So he's going to fend off the attack from the north. Um, also, Ptolemy II had married his sister, which is common practice in these dynasties, Arsinoe the II of Egypt, and she was a strong ruler in herself, very court-wise, and stabilized a very volatile Egyptian court allowing Ptolemy II to successfully carry out his campaign against the attack of Antiochus I. That was the first Syrian war, and the Ptolemies were victorious. Now, so we see the first attack is from the north. The south successfully resists it. That's the first Syrian war. Now, well, that brings us to verse 6. Okay. Go, ahead. Go ahead. I was just 
uh, wanting to understand the screen when you have an X and you have an arrow, if we could know what that means. Thank you. So the red arrow is who is attacking, the X is who is resisting. So if they're successfully resisting, I put a blue X. If they're attacking, I put a red arrow. So we have the north attacking the south, but the south resisting that attack. So that would mean that the south was not overcome by the north when you see a blue X. Exactly. Thank you. Because I know the chart gets keeps adding more, so if we can know that. Amen. It helps that. to understand it. So that brings us to the second Syrian war, okay. starting in verse 6, if you'd be so kind to read. Okay. And in the end of years, they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand, nor his arm, but she shall give, but she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengtheneth her in these times. Can you just read that simply with who the he's are? I'm happy to, and <laughs> history makes it exquisitely clear. Yes. But you're going to see intrigue now of man's way to achieve peace, which never works. It can only end in war. So we'll see what happened. In the end of years now, after the first and second Syrian wars from 272 to 271 BC, the first war, and 260 to 253, the second war, between the kings of the Egypt, the Ptolemies, and the kings of Syria, the Seleucids, at the end of those years, they shall join themselves together. Now, I'm going to talk what this means, and then we'll look at the history. They join themselves together by unifying by intermarriage between the two dynasties. That's how they seek to join forces. For the king's daughter of the south. Now, the king of the south is Ptolemy II. His daughter is Berenice II. She shall come in 253 BC, at the end of the Second Syrian War, to the king of the north, who is Antiochus II. So keep track of this. <laughs> so, the king of the north receives the daughter of the king of the south. So the king of the south is saying, look, I will give you my daughter to establish peace, we'll intermarry, and we'll, things will be just fine, right? Wrong. Here's why. So the king of the north, Antiochus II, receives the king of the, of the south's daughter, Berenice II, to make an agreement of peace, but she, Berenice II, shall not retain power of the arm, that is, of the kingdom because neither shall he, which is Antiochus II, stand to remain in power, nor his arm, that is, uh, uh, nor his arm of the kingdom, but she, Berenice II, shall be given up or killed, and they that brought her, that her ladies are wait in waiting, and he told me the second that begat her, and he, Antiochus II, that strengthened her in these times, both men died in the year 246. So did they kill her? No. Let's see what actually happened. <laughs> okay. So to make sense out of this, the history is crucially important, and let's see what that looks like. So, Antiochus II, in order to marry Berenice II, which is the daughter of Ptolemy the South, here's the northern king ready to marry the daughter of the southern king. The problem is he's already married. In fact, the one he's married to is his wife, <laughs> which was his sister. So, here is Antiochus II, married to his sister, Laodicea. Laodice was her name. And she had two sons. So he put away his wife to marry another woman, the daughter of the king of the south. Now, do you think Laodice was, was happy with this? No. <laughs> she was enraged. But so to make it okay, Antiochus II gave Berenice back power in the court after Berenice's father dies. So in 246, Ptolemy II dies. Berenice's father is dead. So now Antiochus II gives his first wife, his sister, power in the court. Now, to ensure no further disgrace and to secure a future for her son, Seleucus II, what does Laodice do? She causes her husband, Antiochus II, to be poisoned. That's why he doesn't maintain the arm of the state. He dies. He dies the same year of Ptolemy's death, 246. So the year that she's put back and is reinstated in the court, she has her husband poisoned. But she doesn't stop there. The two women, 
right? The two ex-wives now of the deceased Antiochus II of the north. The two are, widows. The two widows are vying for control through their sons to come to the throne. So Antiochus II has a, a child with both women, boys. Both women want their sons to become the new ruler. So there is now a power struggle. So Laodice has a very simple solution to get her son to be the next ruler. She treacherously has her loyal supporters kill Berenice II's son, so he can't come to the throne. Then they have her henchmen kill Berenice II and her ladies-in-waiting. That's horrible. They were brought to bring, that were there to bring her from Egypt. That's why we see in the, in the verse itself, let's look at it carefully, so I'll start in the center. So, so for the king's daughter of the south, Berenice the second, the daughter of Ptolemy the second, shall come in 253 to the king of the north, Antiochus the second, to make an agreement of peace. But Berenice the second shall not retain power of the arm. She won't last. She'll be, she's going to be killed. Neither shall he, Antiochus the second, stand. He's going to be killed. Nor his arm of the kingdom. But she, Berenice the second, shall be given up, killed. And the other brought her, the ladies in waiting killed, and he, Ptolemy the second, um, that begat her, will die, and he, Antiochus the second, that strengthened her in these times, will be murdered by poison in two forty six. That's what the he and the hymns are, referring to this intrigue that happens between the North and South dynasties. It's very dark. It's incredibly dark. Now, behind it, let me just give you a brief history so you see why this happened. So Antiochus II succeeds his father in 261. His father is Antiochus I. Now, he reaches an agreement with the king of the Antigonid Empire to come against Ptolemy II. They want so, to expand their territory. So that's Egypt making an agreement to come together. That's the north, Babylonia. The north. The north is making an agreement to come against the south. So this north, Antiochus II, launches an attack against Ptolemy, the second in Egypt. Now, Antiochus Antigonus, his fleet is defeated by Ptolemy at the Battle of Kos. So Ptolemy the south prevails over that first attack. Um, so Antigonus the fleet defeats, excuse me, defeats the Ptolemy, the Ptolemy Battle of the Kos. So it appears that Ptolemy is losing ground. Excuse me, Ptolemy apparently has to is lost ground in some of his regions. And Antiochus II is regaining some of his ground. But what happens then is Antigonus is called away. So the net effect is war is concluded. Neither side wins. So in order to establish peace, they establish a marriage between the daughter of Ptolemy II, Berenice, and Antiochus II. That's how they reached an agreement of reconciliation. Neither side was winning. And then we see what happened. Laodice, the wife and sister of Antiochus II, is spurned. She has uh, Berenice killed. She has Berenice's son killed. She has her ex-husband, Antiochus II, killed. The same time, Ptolemy II dies. And that's man's way of achieving peace. It cannot sustain. So here we see the king of the north attacks um, successfully, marries Berenice's Berenice II, the daughter of the south, of Ptolemy II's daughter, deposes his own wife. She has him and Berenice and her son killed. The southern Ptolemaic king loses territory and eventually dies. Now, that brings up the third Syrian war. It doesn't end there. Now, this goes on for three verses. And I'd like to pick this up when we start again. Okay. So let me conclude with this concept. We have a north-south conflict. Man is attempting to control man. One dynasty wants to control another dynasty. They're all vying for power. Nothing's changed today. We see nations are angry, each vying for power. Look what happened with Putin and Ukraine as an example, vying for power. Look what happens between China and this country, vying for power. Look what's happening between Democrats and Republicans. Vying for power. Mm -hmm. No difference. We have not changed one iota. There's nothing new under the sun. What's happening today has been shown to us in previous history 
in biblical history and prophetic history to prepare us to understand the dynamics of what's going on today in our world, in this country, now. Nothing new under the sun. Well, that will get clearer as we go on and also as we see how this fits into the book of Revelation. Amen. Yeah. I'm just giving a taste of where this is headed. <laughs> okay. So I'd like to end this with a moment of prayer. Would you be so kind to lead out in sure. concluding prayer? Father in heaven, we come before your throne. You are mighty. You are our God. And you have given us your Son as our Savior. We thank you for these um, prophecies. Um, we see the darkness and complication of them all, but what makes it all simple is to see that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, that you have conquered, and that you are, through Jesus, we are safe and secure in you. We ask that as we wade through these deep prophecies that you would lift us up that we would be able to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that we'd be able to um, wait upon your spirit and call for you to fill us that we can be led to all truth and be shown things to come we thank you so much uh, that you promised that you would give us your spirit and guide us into all truth in Jesus name Amen. Amen